Welcome to the Hunt Back Country podcast presented by Exo Mountain Gear. This podcast and the gear that we produce at Exo Mountain Gear share the same purpose, to make you a more capable, confident, and successful backcountry hunter. Straight to the point, no fluff, and no BS. This show is all about providing you with valuable information from experienced hunters. To learn more about our podcast or about our backcountry hunting packs, please visit exomountaingear.com. Well, thank you so much for joining us on this episode. Our guest is Scott Bodel, and he is a wildlife biologist and forest protection officer for the U.S. Forest Service. We talk with Scott about quite a few topics. We talk a bit about habitat improvement. We talk about how to get good information from Forest Service officers if you're scouting to hunt in a different area. And we spend a good time talking about vehicle use on public lands when that is legal, when it is not legal, how we can use off-road vehicles in the proper way and things we should avoid, as well as what to do if we notice illegal vehicle use in the backcountry. A couple more things before we dive into this episode. The Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Rendezvous is coming to Boise, the home of Exo Mountain Gear, in April. The dates are the 12th through the 14th, and if you register by March 1st, you can save $25. So this is an awesome multi-day event that features breakout sessions and speakers, films, exhibitors, seminars, a cool hike, an enjoyable time for sure. If you want to learn more about that, if you're from Idaho or surrounding areas and can make it into Boise, again, those dates are April 12th through 14th. Just go to backcountryhunters.org to learn more about the rendezvous, see all the pricing, the schedule, and the other details you need. Finally, before we get into this episode, just want to give a shout out to Chris Checkets for leaving us a review in iTunes. We really appreciate that, Chris, and we want to send you some Exo Mountain Gear and Hunt Backcountry swag. So email us your shipping information to podcast at exomountaingear.com. Listeners, if you want to be entered into these giveaways, it's really simple. We just want to see your feedback. If you could leave us a review in iTunes, on Stitcher, wherever else you might be listening to this, or contact us directly with your questions, comments, or suggestions to podcast at exomountaingear.com. Okay, let's dive into this episode with wildlife biologist and forest protection officer, Scott Bodel. Scott, welcome to the Hunt Backcountry podcast. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, Steve, how's it going, buddy? I'm good, man. I'm uh, excited to uh, chat with Scott here and, and learn about... Uh, where we can and can't drive four wheelers and motorcycles and bikes and all that stuff. Cause it's a definitely a, a topic. I think anybody who hits the back country gets pretty confused on at times. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, let's, let's get into your background a bit, Scott, and kind of introduce us to your current role and maybe how you got there a little bit. That'd be great. Okay. Yeah. So I am a district wildlife biologist with the U S forest service. Uh, I've worked for the forest service since 2000, four um straight out of college i got on uh i was one of the fortunate ones and was able to get a permanent position right out of college which is you know fairly rare um mainly because of my military service and i had veterans preference points so that gave me a big leg up but um so since that time i've worked in Oregon on the Wallowa Whitman and the Rogue River Siskiyou National Forest. And then I came to the Boise National Forest about 10 years ago. Um, and so I work on the Mountain Home Ranger District, which is roughly 675,000 acres. As a wildlife biologist, I uh, do a variety of other things. I am also a forest protection officer, which means I go out and contact users on the forest and can issue minor violation notices and stuff like that. And then I head up basically any wildlife uh, habitat improvement type projects. And I work with Idaho Fish and Game a lot, trying to coordinate and uh, sportsmen's groups. Yeah, awesome. How, what got you interested in pursuing this um, from the military? What made you kind of lean towards this as your transition? You know, coming out of the military, I, well, I knew I was going to do wildlife. So I've, I've kind of always known that's where I was going to go is, you know, I can pull up papers I wrote in like fifth grade about <laughs> what do you want to be? And 
it's pretty amazing because it was like wildlife biologist and or park ranger or something like that. So that's cool. Uh, yeah. So my dad had saved all these papers and stuff, and then he'd gone through them at some point, like five years ago, and was getting ready to just scrap a bunch of it. And he found all these papers, and he's like, "Look at this! You were really set. <laughs> you knew what you wanted." <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so yeah, so I was in the Marines for four years on active duty. I got my GI Bill, came out, went into college, um, started more forestry oriented, and then I uh, finished up like some associate programs and then transferred into the University of Idaho, uh, got my bachelor's degree. And from there, I just, honestly, I I lucked into the Forest Service job. I was just walking through the College of Natural Resources building, and uh, there was a group of people sitting at a table from the Forest Service doing job interviews. And uh, I just struck up a conversation with them, started talking with them, and uh, they ended up interviewing me right there. And then uh, basically told me how to send out an application to all these places across the country and see what happens. And I got into a program that, um, as a junior, I had to work one full summer. And then when I graduated, I converted over into a permanent position. So as hunters, I mean, we're all familiar with, uh, the forest service with wildlife biologists, with forest strangers, these different terms, but kind of give us a better idea of what role you play. I know that, you know, probably changes maybe from season to season and obviously from day to day, but kind of fill us in on maybe what we don't know about your job and your roles. Yeah. So I work with the forest service. So we land, we kind of manage the land and so I don't go out as much as I'd like to, I, you know, get out and handle animals and do stuff with the populations. That is up to the state agencies. What I do is do what I can to manage land. So anytime we have any kind of project on Forest Service land or BLM land, any federal land, it has to go through an analysis, which we call the, um, <clears throat> basically the short term is NEPA. So basically, we go through this process, and I do an analysis on what the effects are to wildlife species. And we kind of have a set list of animals that we have to analyze. And then uh, when we're looking at it, if we think there's other wildlife that may be impacted or negatively affected or beneficially affected, we go ahead and we'll analyze that too. And uh, then the line officer, so if you look at the Forest Service, we have National Forests. So I work on the Boise National Forest and then the Mountain Home Ranger District. And so there's a district ranger who signs all the decisions for that district. So if we want to put in an underground telecommunications line, I do the analysis, a bunch of other specialists look at their area. So like fisheries, hydrology, soils, range, and we all basically do an analysis on it. And then based off of what we determine, the ranger then makes a determination on whether, you know, that project should happen or shouldn't happen or should have certain mitigations in order to happen. Um, it's also my job to try and develop projects that are going to benefit wildlife. So, for example, if we have like a big fire, which my district's had quite a few since 2012, I think we've burned somewhere in the neighborhood of 370,000 acres. Um, <clears throat> so in those areas, I looked at areas where, you know, hey, this was key deer and elk winter range, or this used to be a sage grouse lex site, you know, and we need to kind of go in and improve this. And so then I'll write a bunch of grants, try and get money from partners. I'll try and get money through the forest and our region. And then we'll go out there and we'll do projects to try and enhance that area. Um, so, for example, in Mule Deer Winter Range, it may be planting bitterbrush. And so I'll get a bunch of 
money from different areas. And then we'll go ahead and we'll go out and we'll plant bitter brush seedlings in that area to try and enhance it and bring it back quicker for the mule deer. Hmm, that's cool. With with those projects like that, do you guys rely on any sort of volunteer base from any of the conservation organizations or is it all forest service employees? How does that work when, in terms of uh, boots on the ground and getting shovels dirty? No, we, we use a lot of the different avenues. So on my district, I've used Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, uh, 4-H groups. I've had volunteers from uh, DHA. Uh, I've had funding from RMEF and uh, Idaho Fish and Game has kicked in a bunch of money to help. And uh, we put it out to the local Air Force base here, Mountain Home Air Force Base. And we got a bunch of volunteers from them that came out. That's awesome. Uh, the local school groups, church groups. I mean, I, I've had uh, probably about 500 volunteers from you name it type of organizations, mostly in the local community, come out and help. Fantastic, yeah. Yeah, it's cool to hear of like money and time and all of that coming from the groups that we as hunters are hopefully supporting, like BHA and you know Rocky Mountain Elk, like you mentioned. It's cool to hear from your perspective that these projects are actually happening because of because of those uh, organizations. Really couldn't without those groups. Yeah, that's awesome. What type of interactions do you have uh, with hunters during the season or things like that? Are you in the field much? Well. So I'll get phone calls leading up to the season, looking for information and stuff like that, you know, and as part of my job, I'm out there on the ground as much as possible, not nearly as much as I'd like, but as much as possible out in the field looking at stuff. And uh, so I'll answer any questions, give any tips I can give them, you know, ideas on where to go. And then come hunting season, uh, I get out. And I'll give up a couple of my weekends and I'll go do trolls, making contacts, talking to hunting groups, going into camps, talking with them. And uh, if I have like key areas where I'm getting lots of reports and we're getting just lots of reports of people going into where they shouldn't be, I'll actually go out and do enforcement patrols and issue citations if, if needed, um, <clears throat> which is kind of what led me to contact you guys yeah. mm. travel management plan has been in place on my district the mountain home district since 2007 so like this year i think i wrote 14 citations one day and um people were just like well you know since when <laughs> <laughs> right. i'm like so 2007 so <laughs> you know just a decade that's all yeah so do yeah. you, is, you said you kind of give up a couple of weekends during the season. Is there somebody else that has that as a, uh, you know, a full-time job or is it really just kind of uh, yeah, a so few of you guys helping out as when, when and if possible? We have one full-time law enforcement officer, okay. um, which is what we call a level one. So they carry a gun, they're a federal officer and they can do any kind of stops and, mm. um, you know, they got the lights, sirens, guns, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so he patrols this huge area. Uh, we're right outside of Boise. So we have the middle fork of the Boise River and Ooh. the south fork of the Boise River. And those are the yeah. two areas where most of our use Appers, occurs. Yeah. So, yeah, so he's covering a huge area. And so because of that, we have the forest protection officers. And there's there's a couple of us. And... It's kind of dependent on the person. You know, there's no written in stone. You have to go out and patrol um, on this weekend. It's whether we have the interest or the funding to get those other people out there. And uh, a lot of it comes down to funding. And right. So I go out and, and I just do it because I'm a hunter. I'm out there all the time. Um I get frustrated at times when people are going into closed areas, you know, uh, on my daughter's first deer hunt last season, we got up there before dark, hiked into an area and I had 14 UTVs and ATVs come into that site. 
and my daughter was lucky enough we got her a doe um and so the next day it was a sunday and i went back up there uh to write citations and make contacts and you know make a presence mm-hmm. and uh some of the other hunters that had been up there the day before that I talked to uh, took it upon themselves to kind of block that gated area. <laughs> vehicles. And so when I rolled up there, there were, I think, 12 vehicles parked in front of the gate and uh, everybody was walking in, and uh, which was great. I was so happy that yeah. hunters on themselves to do that, um, you know, as long as they they were actually blocking the road, which can be bad, you know, say there's right. a wild in there and we needed to get in with like engines or something like that. Um, but the fact that people had taken it upon themselves to kind of police other hunters was great. And, uh, we get a lot of people that will report others for mm-hmm. infractions and stuff like that. And, uh, I always try and follow up on it. Uh, not every time am I going to be able to do a citation, you know, because right. I have to yeah. have coordinates, photos, stuff like that. Right. Yeah, that's definitely a question. I mean, it seems like every conversation with somebody at some point, there's, yeah, somebody, some, you know, Yahoo wrote a four wheel around the gate that I was hunting and I took pictures and they report it. And I was wondering, like, how much of that stuff actually can, you know, do you have the resources to follow up on and, and make sure that someone's getting a citation for that? It, it can be problematic because it, yeah. there can be so many occurrences that it's just really hard to follow up on. Right. Um, you know, I had pictures, I had, you know, a GPS point and I followed up on it and, uh, on two ATVs and found out who the owner was. The vehicles hadn't been registered in like four years. So that's another problem. If they haven't registered their vehicle, it makes it a lot harder. Mm. Um, but I, I found out who the owner was and I went and I contacted him. He's like, I had no idea who was riding them. They're up at a cabin that's, you know, available to like tons of different families and everything up there is shared, you know, and <laughs> from there, I, there's nowhere really I can go. I'd, right. I'd love to write that guy a ticket, but the way it works, I, that wouldn't be able to stick in court. Yeah, I'm sure that's got to be an uphill frustrating battle for you at times. Yeah. Are there other things that we as hunters can do if we observe, um, you know, illegal off-road vehicle use? Yeah. I mean, when I'm out hunting, I'll contact people and be like, you know, hey, you know, this is a closed area and I'll try and show them how I know it's closed. So, um, and if you want to get into the meat of it, I can tell you. On my district, we passed our travel management planning in 2007, which made us in line with the 2005 planning rule, which was sent down to all the Forest Service. So all national forest lands were supposed to go through travel management planning and then produce travel management maps, what we call motor vehicle use maps. And those designate what is open and what it's open to. And those maps are free at any district office. You can go online and get them. Uh, if you're familiar with the Avenza map, it's an app that you can download for free. And then you can go and you can search, say, I want to go up to the Loman Ranger District on the Boise National Forest. So I can go into the search and put in, in Loman motor vehicle use map and do a search and it'll come up with that map and I can download it for free. And then when I'm up in that area, it shows me whether I have telephone signal or not, my location on that map, it shows like a blue dot or a green dot or whatever it's set to. And so you can see, are you on the road or are you not? And if you're not on the road and you're driving a ATV, then you're in violation. What was that app name? How do you spell it? Avenza. It's uh, A V. Let's see, A V E N S A, I believe. Okay. Is now is that something that's um, nationwide for the, all four service districts? Yeah. So basically, as far as I'm aware, 
One Force has not completed it, and that's because of litigation. And that's the Walla Whitman. Um, every other forest and ranger district has gone through their travel management planning. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one thing I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, hopefully, especially if we're just hunting an area that we might be familiar with, maybe that we live close by, hopefully we take the time to understand that area. It can obviously be more difficult or at least feel more challenging if we're going to a different state or an entirely different district. So from the Forest Service perspective, because so many of us hunt Forest Service lands in one form or another, are the rules pretty straightforward in terms of district to district as just knowing which roads are open and which aren't? Or are there other things that we need to be uh, paying attention to as we move maybe from district to district? Yeah, so... Basically, the the plan is the same for all of them. And what it says is that we have to have created a map, a motor vehicle use map. And so it doesn't matter if you're in New Mexico, Montana, Idaho, California. If you're on Forest Service land, you should be able to get for free the motor vehicle use map for that area. And then they're all the same. They're basically a white piece of paper uh, with roads drawn on them. They don't have topo lines. They don't have rivers. They're pretty basic, uh, which is why I don't like them for navigating with the hard copies. If you really don't know how to land navigate using a paper map, it can be difficult, uh, which is why you know we encourage people to download the app um, so if you go into a district office, most of them will have like a QR reader, like scan thing, mm -hmm. and you can click on it. It'll get you the app, and then it can get you the maps. And like in my my office, we have all the maps for the Boise National Forest and most of the Sawtooth National Forest available right there. You just click it. It's instantaneously. You just, it downloads real quick on your phone and then you have it. Um, now if I'm planning a trip to another state and another district or forest, I, I usually go to their website first and I'll look at it and uh, look for travel management or search for it on their web page and then get there. And then a lot of times I'll download the maps that way. That's how I do it when I travel and go to other states. Okay, perfect. So what, besides a road being open or closed, I mean, is it that black and white to understand what is and isn't allowed in terms of off-road vehicle use? What are some of the other aspects to this whole issue? So it'll show you what's open. It'll show you where dispersed camping is allowed. It'll show you different types of roads. So is it open to all vehicles or is it open to 50 inches or less, which are ATVs and smaller. So, um, and if you start looking at the, all the different vehicles that there are now, uh, <clears throat> it, it gets pretty difficult. So what we do is we do a size class. So if it's wider than 50 inches, it can go on a road but it cannot go on a trail designated for 50 inches or less, which are ATVs and motorcycles. Um, so if you have one of those big like razors or something like that, you know, you could be limited on where you can take that. One. So you have to be careful and know, you know, what, what you're driving and, uh, and then look at the map. And it doesn't show hiking trails. It only shows the motorized routes. Yeah, that was, that was going to be one of my next questions is what was, how do we know on trails? What's the resource for that? But so if it's hiking trails, then you have to look at basically one of the forest maps will cover that. And uh, mm -hmm. those are something you have to pay for. Um, but you can, you can buy like the Boise National Forest map for like, I want to say nine ninety nine, but mm -hmm. don't quote me on that. And uh, you can download the entire forest map, and it will give you the routes. It will give you hiking trails. It will give you lakes and everything else that you're kind of looking for. 
Um, it's not going to be at a super fine scale, but it'll definitely get you around and you can use it to navigate to go find a campground or um, a hot springs or a lake or a trailhead, something like that. Mm -hmm. And the other to the travel map apps is that they show ownership. So show you private lands are white and forest service lands are gray. Now, so it's not going to show you BLM or some other public lands, but if you're in an area where it's just forest service and private, um, you can use it to tell whether you're on forest service land or not. Do you see that um, occurrences of illegal use increase during hunting season from hunters that are not obeying the rules, or is this primarily an issue where it's just recreational riders and off-road, you know, enthusiasts that? Or out there during hunting season, for example. I mean, obviously, we could be out there uh, all year and there'd be illegal use, but from our perspective as hunters during season, wh what are the most common infractions? Is it from hunters? Yeah. So when hunting season starts, there's a definite uptick and people going into area closed for vehicles. Um, your average people just out during July on a ATV ride across the forest. Um, a lot of them drive the roads uh, and we do get occasions when they go into areas, but it's nowhere near as much as we get during hunting season because everybody during hunting season is trying to get you know that much farther from everyone else. And uh, it, it seems like less and less people are just parking and walking in then, you know, oh, well, I can get my ATV up this ridge line. So if I get it up this ridge line, then that puts me there, you know, in half an hour instead of a two hour hike. And that uh, gets me that far ahead of everyone else. But pretty soon that ridge line has a big trail right down the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, everyone's going in there. When, when that happens, what, I mean, I guess... It Somebody reports it to you and hopefully you guys, I mean, how, how does that even work? You go in there with a, a tractor and do a big berm, try to deter people. What's your kind of, you know, what happened? I mean, I've obviously I've run across that. I just ran across that in late 39 archery hunt, just some, a, a motorcycle trail that was just cut in, you know, and you could tell somebody was riding in there and it's not a trail that's on any map and it shouldn't be there. And, um, you know, what, what's kind of the process that you go through to, to shut that down? So, Basically, you report it to the district, and then it gets sent to someone like me. So uh, if you found something in Unit 39, that's typically going to go to me because most of that unit is on my district. And then I am actually putting together a project right now with a BHA, and we're going to provide material, and they're going to provide labor, uh, hopefully starting in the spring. And we're going to go out and depending on what it is, so there could be an old logging road that's been kind of brushed over for years, but now it's been pushed open by ATVs and dirt bikes and stuff like that. So in that case, we might go out and <clears throat> put in a gate and mm -hmm. then uh, sign it. Um, sometimes if it's in an area where there's not really any natural material or real way to close it, we'll try and sign it. Uh, okay. But what happens? Is we'll put a sign in the ground and by the following day during hunting season that sign will be gone right and so i went into one area this year during the 39 rifle hunt and put the sign in and the next day it was gone and i issued some citations and i put another sign in and it was gone again and people are like well it's not signed and so that's what the big thing with the travel management is. Yeah. Prior to 2005, we had to sign whether it was open or closed. Now we don't have to. Our motor vehicle use map is our signage. So uh, okay. it, it got rid of us having to go out there constantly putting in signs just to have them ripped out or shot up or run over. And uh, because, you know, it's a lot of money that we're spending trying to sign these roads continuously just mm -hmm. to have somebody come up, you know, an hour later and 
tie up to it with their ATV and pull out that sign, you know? And mm-hmm. I, I've issued a citation to a guy who there was a, what we used to do tank traps is what they were called or Kelly humps. Um, you know, where you kind of dug out with an excavator and, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> guy with his dirt bike was using the sign. He'd hit that jump fast enough. He'd jump over the dip and, uh, he jumping off that sign. <laughs> and I <laughs> sat there and I recorded him and I walked up and I was like, are you having fun? And he's like, yeah, just messing around. I'm like, well, you know, you, you've kind of broken that sign. And he's like, well, you know, who cares? And, um, I took off my jacket so that he could see my forest service shirt. And I was like, well, you know, I put that sign in there. <laughs> and uh, I, I do kind of care and that uh, ended up issuing on um, my citation what are the consequences of a citation uh what's kind of the repercussions of getting busted so if you're in a closed area with a motor vehicle in idaho it's 230 dollars all right the fine. i wish it was like two thousand dollars <laughs> there's a lot of people talking um about that yeah, yeah. And and that, would be, that would be an actual deterrent. You get enough of those people that ticket, and then, and then they would, you know, that word would get around and they'd stop doing it. Yeah, they'd start to care. Yeah. yeah. Is it? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of sportsman groups, and I'm active with several of them. You know, and they've been kind of seeing, you know, hey, what do we need to do to try and curb this now? Right. You know, because it's getting worse and worse. I mean, 10 years ago, how many ATVs were out there? You know, mm-hmm. 20 years ago. There were hardly any. I, mean, I can't think of ever running into an ATV 20 years ago when I was out elk hunting. Now, yeah. well, I've hiked into some areas and I thought there is no way anybody can get in here. And sure enough, there they are. Is it is the law is currently, is it just if you get caught again and again, it's just another 230 or does that escalate? So for me, when I stop somebody, I'm not running them like a regular cop would. So I'm not doing a check. I don't have a computer that I can run. Besides that, I'm usually in the boonies. And so I wouldn't have any kind of signal or a way to do it anyway. Um, so what I do is I kind of keep a, a tally of people and vehicles. And then um, and I take a picture every time. So a lot of times when I'll stop somebody, I'll scroll through real quick and try and see if there's somebody I've, you know, like if I get that feeling, you know, boy, this guy seems really familiar. Feels like I've had this conversation before. I'll go back through. And so then we can do a mandatory appearance where they have to go talk to the actual federal judge and explain it. And then the fines go up quite a bit. So what was, um, I think Mark asked a little bit earlier, but like what, I mean, I catch a guy breaking the rules. I mean, what's, great evidence you need to make sure that he gets fined i mean is it picture just picture of his license plate in a gps location or i mean what's kind of the, the two three four five things you need to to make sure that guy gets in trouble for it so it's a picture of the person picture of the vehicle with like a license plate and a gps point okay. with those three things i'm usually going to be able to track somebody down because I can go down to the DMV and run the plate, get the name of the owner, and then I can go contact that owner. And if it's not them, you know, usually I can find out who the person they lent that piece of equipment to was and okay. then issue them the citation. So, um, yeah, so without the picture of that person, someone could just say, oh, I let a friend borrow my truck, and then yeah, kind of exactly. stops it from you. Yeah, okay. Good reason to have a phone scope or something at all times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not encouraging people to go out there and like confront people, you know? And right. So that's the other thing. You have to be, make sure you're safe when you're going out there. Right. You know, don't confront somebody and like, I'm taking your picture and reporting you, you know? Yeah. And uh, I'd hate to have somebody, you know, then pull a gun and have things escalate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that'd be a terrible situation. I, I just know for me personally, I mean, it's it's a yearly, you know, multiple times a year does this happen uh, where, you know, there's, I see something and or see someone doing something illegal and you never really know what steps to, to take. 
Yeah. And, you know, there's so you can report them to Fish and Game. You know, you can report them to the, the Forest Service and, you know, BLM lands a little bit different. So the BLM doesn't have an agreement with Idaho Fish and Game. And so conservation officers can't site on BLM land for travel violations. Um, but they can on Forest Service land. But their tickets are, I want to say like a hundred bucks. They're, they're not as steep as okay. our federal citations. Do you have any other advice for the listeners out there um, that do use off-road vehicles? Again, besides checking the maps, besides doing um, the proper steps of scouting the area beforehand, are there any other infractions or any other issues that they might run into? Maybe even, I don't say quote-unquote accidentally, but just things to be aware of so that the hunters listening to this that do use vehicles can make sure that they're doing it responsibly. Yeah. So in some areas like the state may allow big game retrieval. And so I'll go up and I'll speak to somebody and they're like, well, you know, I shot my gear. I'm going down. I'm picking it up. I'm like, okay. You know, the state may authorize that, but that doesn't, you know, our guidelines trump theirs in this case. So we're, it's federal land, you know, we're the land management agency. So it's our regulations that are going to have a effect. So making sure you know that ahead of the time. And, uh, you know, the maps, I carry one of the hard copy maps with me all the time because it has so much information on it. Um, and it, it's harder to see it on the app, but uh, I really like looking through that. So you know, making sure, and it's so easy to call any place you're going to go and talk to that district. And our, our frontliners up there, you know, answering the phones and dealing with the public coming in, they're all very aware of what the rules are. Uh, they're all very knowledgeable. And so they're going to help anybody so that they can go out and have a good time um, without doing anything negative. Mm. So, can you go back there for me? I mean, so Fish and Game can say it's it's legal to go in and retrieve an animal with a four wheeler, but if you're on, is that would be state land and BLM land, but not on Forest Service land? Yeah. So, if you go through, for example, Idaho hunting regs, it'll say, um, you know, in this unit, big game retrieval is authorized, but and they'll have it down below. You also must follow the land management agency's guidelines. And so that's the key. And so like if you're on IDL land, you know, some of it is open and you can drive. There are lower elevation like sagebrush stuff. Some of it you can go anywhere you want. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't like that. You know, I, I like yeah. walking. I, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. concentrate most of the use to one area so that you can then get out away. No, I was going to say, I know, I think I know a sp- another specific area where uh, I, I guess it's, it's probably, it's pretty tricky for you guys between you guys and, and Idaho fishing game where there's this one spot that you can, you can ride your four wheeler in there. If you say you're, if you're actually camping and then you can hunt from your camp. So if you had like a, a tent and a sleeping bag and a pad on your four wheeler, you could ride in there and camp. Um, and hunt from there, but you couldn't ride your four wheeler in for the day and hunt, uh, and then come back out. And it's such a, you know, it seems so silly, uh, to even have to like how to enforce that and uh, that that exists. Can you kind of explain a little bit of that? I mean, is that fishing game rules conceding with your rules or is that just fishing game doing that? Yeah. I, you know, I'm trying to think of an area where I've encountered that. Um, on our stuff, we allow certain activities off of the roads, but it's not very far. So like, for example, dispersed camping, mm-hmm. um, you know, in, in this area, it may be, you can go up to 200 feet off the road to disperse camp, Okay. Uh, whatever it says on that map and that's it. And so we're, we're allowing that use off of the road, but it's for that use or 
you can go cut firewood up to, you know, so far off and then drive your vehicle to load it. But if you're up there and you just drove off basically the road to save yourself 200 feet dragging your deer out, that isn't acceptable. Yeah, that's not acceptable. That's not what, you know, the rule states. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's it's uh it gets tough. I mean, especially for the hunter. Like I said, Mark, you're you're coming from out of state, heading into a new area, and you got to be, you know, if you're coming to Idaho, you got to check with Forest Service. You got to check with Fish and Game and balance all these rules out. And that's um that's a lot. That's tough. Yeah, I, I mean, they put a lot on people now. Yeah, you know, uh, I I don't know if it'll get any easier. Uh, there's more and yeah. more people coming out. Um, machines are getting more and more capable right. of doing, things. you know, like I have snowmobiles. I have two snowmobiles. One's 15 years old. One's two years old. The difference between those is, <laughs> yeah. you know, right. right. One I want to use in my driveway and that's about it. And the other one, if I want to go climb a mountain, I probably can. Yeah. Hmm. That's a yeah. It's an uphill battle for for everybody, really, for the for the hunter keeping up with all the rules that are changing and making sure he's within the laws, and and for you to to get out there and enforce them. Yeah, and you know, I mean, when I go out and I I've had some hunts in areas outside of my where I work, so mm-hmm. I've had to do that same thing. So, for example, I had a moose tag up on the Clearwater, and So I went into their office on my way up to the camp thinking, oh, I'll just stop into the office and grab the travel management map and um, I should be good to go. And uh, they had not developed their travel management maps at that time. And I'm not sure if they have yet. But so I went in there and I started asking the guy and he's like, you know, I'm not really familiar with what you're talking about. And I'm like, okay, so... (laughs) I pulled out a travel management map and he's like, Oh yeah, now I know we don't have those yet. And I was like, okay, so how do I know where I can and can't go? You know? And I ended up spending like two hours in that office grilling this guy. So cause the last thing I want to do is go up and then get busted doing something. Right. Yeah. Especially you being an officer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, it sounds like that's become more standardized, though, right? You kind of mentioned earlier it's become more widespread for these districts to have those plans uh, finalized and published for the most part. Yeah, so getting ready for this podcast, I was just kind of curious. And so I started going to random forest websites and looking. And uh, everyone I went to, except for the Willow Whitman, and I think the Clearwater has their plan in place, but they haven't produced the maps yet. I went to at least 15 other forests in like six states and they had all theirs done. Yeah, I got a couple more questions to ask you, but they're not related to the road or off-road vehicle use. So is there anything there that we didn't cover that you want to make sure our listeners and hunters know about? Uh, <clears throat> no, I think we kind of touched on everything. You know, I was just basically trying to do what I would do when I stop somebody. You know, right. this is kind of the conversation I have with people. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I think it's incredibly helpful for sure. Um, so one of the questions I had is something you mentioned earlier that you do a bit with the job, and that's fielding calls from hunters who may be calling in about hunting information. Uh, how, give us some tips on how to do that and how to get good information if we are calling, uh, you know, maybe an out of state or just a different region forest district, um, that we're interested in hunting. What should we as hunters do before that call during that call, kind of after that call to get good information? When I'm going somewhere, basically I'll kind of look at it and scout it from the computer and from maps. And I'm a little bit more old school and I have a huge box full of maps so every time i go i also fight fire during the summer so anytime i go to a forest on a fire assignment i buy one of their maps and i bring it home with me and so i have this gigantic collection of maps and uh so if i 
find an area that I think I want to go to and uh, for whatever reason, I'll, I'll look at the maps and then I will kind of look at whatever draws, whatever to get the tag. And then I typically call the land management agency first it's just because I work for the Forest Service. So, you know, I'll call up and I'll be like, Hey, you know, my name is Scott Bothell. I work on the Mountain Home Ranger District as a wildlife biologist. I'll be like, you know, I just got some questions. If you give me some answers. I'm looking at this area. You know, what do you think as far as elk? You know, when you're out there, are you seeing good numbers? Are you familiar with it? Um, and so I'll ask them that. I'll ask them how long they've worked there. Uh, because if they've only worked there six months, they're not going to have as much knowledge, but they may be able to refer me to somebody who does. I'll ask them if they hunt. And uh, just because, you know, they may be a biologist, um, but they're not hunting. They're not going to really have some of the information I'm looking for, you know. So I, if I'm like, you know, you know, this looks like a great canyon up in here. Have you ever been in there? Are there any wallows, stuff like that? You know, um, a non-hunter might not understand the importance of a elk wallow during September. Yeah, that's a great point. Those are some good tips that I haven't heard of. Yeah, and so, and I'll, I'll talk to that person, and then I'll ask them, hey, anybody in your office that hunts that area, you know, that might be available? I mean, we all, everybody who works for the Forest Service works for the public. So, you know, if you call them, they are getting paid to answer your questions and help the public. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what we do. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I've, you know, we've talked about before calling with specific areas in mind and not just saying, Hey, are there any elk up in unit, whatever? Um, which is obviously a good thing to do, but yeah, those points on getting information on how long that person's worked there, if they hunt themselves, that's good stuff. Or even asking again for a hunter that they know of that hunts that area. That's incredibly helpful. Yeah. And, you know, I, I get a lot of calls and they're like, Hey, you know, I have this tag. Um, where can I go shoot a deer? And, you know, maybe, you know, Hey, I'm getting on an age, so I'm looking for a big buck, but I can't get far from the road. You know, there, we do have places like that, you know, with like some controlled hunts. So if you're familiar with Idaho. We have unit 44 and 45 which I work in and that uh, there's some monster mule deer in there, but there's also, you know, 5,000 people applying for a hundred tags or whatever it is. So <laughs> yeah. I was drawing it aren't very good. Um, so in those areas, yeah, you can maybe not put in as much work or you can put in a ton of work and shoot a monster deer, you know, near or far from the road. Mm -hmm. um, just what the person is going to do. But if it's an area that has general hunts and stuff like that, it, it makes it tough. And a lot of times I'm like, you know, if they call for an elk and they're like, where can I find an elk? And I'm, my first thing is find a map, find an area, no roads within a mile of it, and then start there. Hmm. Just <laughs> hike that mile and then start looking for sign and work your way around. All right. So, sometimes <laughs> it doesn't have to be a mile if it's really steep. A lot of hunters fall out when they have, you know, when it takes them an hour and a half to go half a mile straight up a hill through brush and blow down. Who wants to do that, right? <laughs> yeah. And can I can tell you, easier. That, it's not any, any fun. Everything leading up to packing it out is fun, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, to wrap up, Scott, uh, we talk so much about uh, your quote unquote day job. I'd love to hear maybe a fun hunting story or hunting memory from you. You know, the, the biggest thing that's happened for me is my daughter just started hunting. So she's 11 now. And uh, so last year was her first year and she got a deer. In the spring, I took her out and she got a, a bear. But the first animal she wanted to hunt was a moose. And so I put her in last year for a tag and I put her in this year and this year she drew. Awesome. And, uh, <laughs> so she's 11 years old. So we're going out and we're practicing our shooting and getting ready for this big hunt. And, you know, I'm 
carrying a pack with Wade getting ready, you know, boy, because it's just me and her. And so I'm going to have to pack this moose out by myself. And uh, so she had a cow tag. I didn't want her to have a bull tag at this age. I just, I was worried she wouldn't remember it as much, you know, mm -hmm. and it's a once in a lifetime kind of thing. So she got a cow tag. And so we went out season open October 15th and uh, boy, it was cold and there was like six inches of snow. And uh, the year before we'd gone over there and hunted whitetail and it had been like 75 <laughs> degrees. And so the fact that it was like 20 degrees that opening morning, I was just like, oh boy, this is going to be, this is going to be a hunt. And so we went up into an area where I could look down into the river bottoms and try and glass a moose. And uh, so we sat there for a while and the wind was just blowing. We were freezing. So we got up and decided to walk kind of this rim looking down into the uh, river bottom and uh, didn't see a thing. And so we, we walked back to where we sat that morning and uh, we we're kind of making a plan on what to do. And I heard a cow moose just start calling down the bottom. I'm like, holy cow, there's a moose down in there and so we're looking and looking and we cannot see it anywhere and i was like all right let's, let's go down in and see if we can find it and so we went down in there and we got close and i heard her calling and so i started doing some bull grunts thinking you know maybe she'd step out and we'd be able to uh see her and that uh, instead a bull came from downwind of us walked right by us at like 20 yards and stopped in front and was in front of us and was looking at us and uh it was just amazing you know he wasn't a huge bull but still we had you know it's opening morning it's an hour and a half into the hunt we got bull moose standing at 20 yards in front of us and uh boy he caught that cow scent and she, she was in heat and he went in there and there was just a ton of ruckus and he was chasing her all over the place and then things got quiet like an hour later and it was just too thick. And so we backed out and said, we'd kind of try and come back later and went to run into town to get more propane for the camper came on an ATV accident. Um, we were the first ones on the scene. So I called it into nine one one. I'm trying to do first aid to this lady and help her. And, uh, we're, the road blocked up and stuff and the ambulance shows up and the police are there and we're all talking and stuff. And, uh, so I was talking to him, telling him what we were doing. And this guy walks up to see if he knew the people or something. And, uh, he's like, wait, you're, you're hunting moose. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, Hey, there was a cow right back this area and a calf and a bull. And I was like, wow, that's right next to where that cow was when we were hunting this morning and uh he's like yeah they're like a hundred yards off the road up under this rim rock bedded down and i was like oh so we jumped in the truck and went back down there and uh got out and kind of walked walked up in and sure enough the calf saw us and she spooked and she ran down across the road and went down all the way down into the river bottom and the cow came up and walked up and uh, we were probably 50 yards and my, my daughter shot her once. She took a step, turned around, shot her again, and she just dropped right there. Wow. And I think we were from the road. <laughs> it was wow. just <laughs> and I, it's a pile of guys stopped and we were able to pull it right to the road and uh, a <laughs> hole and just load it in the back of the truck. I, just amazing how That's it all unreal. worked out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, that's cool what rifle was your daughter shooting so she's shooting a tika uh 308 a 308 okay i was just wondering you know you think of moose being such a large animal and then you have a little you know 11 year old i'm like how do you play that with caliber choice yeah it was well the whole rifle selection was pretty tough um trying to from the beginning and i didn't really know anything about the 6.5 at that time and so I thought, you know, my first rifle was a thirty out six, but now I use a three hundred Win Mag if I use a rifle, which is very rare, pretty much strictly archery now. And um, 
so I was talking to some friends and, you know, ended up deciding on the 308. And then we, uh, we were using those like reduced recoil rounds. Mm-hmm. And uh, so she got used to it and she was shooting those. And then uh, I, I switched her to a little bit heavier grain bullet, um, not reduced recoil. I had her shoot off the lead sled to make sure it was still sighted in the same, you know, and she'd been practicing shooting off shooting sticks and everything else. Um, but I really didn't want to spook her, you know, trying to shoot a bigger round beforehand and have her get kind of gun shy. And so uh, she shot off the lead sled and she was sighted in perfect, still doing great. And so, yeah, she didn't even say a word about the recoil. Yeah. After- <laughs> twice I like it it's all different when adrenaline's flowing oh yeah yeah it's a huge difference it's like you know I I tried to get her to shoot the 12 gauge um, last spring for turkey and I was like well here let's just try it out you know and she shot it and she's like nope not (laughs) shooting that (laughs) Uh, yeah did you have turkey loads in it too no no I was gonna say (laughs) goodness gracious (laughs) No, nope, she she went back down to the twenty gauge though. I was like, and we ended up regretting that because she shot a tom. And I watched those pellets just bounce right off them. Right. <laughs> was, yeah. Yeah, and that's cool. That's awesome. Very that's cool. a better story than I was even hoping for. It's cool to hear about the kids getting out there. Yeah, yeah. I I love taking her out. We uh, went duck hunting this morning. Going tomorrow morning before I go into work probably get in like a four hour hunt awesome well scott this has been uh this has been helpful i really appreciate it uh personally just knowing uh, a better approach for the future and i'm sure our listeners feel the same way so thank you for sharing the time and knowledge with us yeah thank you very much for having me well that's a wrap on this one guys again thank you so much for tuning in be sure to contact us if you have any questions comments or suggestions to podcast at xomongear.com. If you're enjoying the show, we would love if you could leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever else you might be listening to this. And don't forget about the BHA Rendezvous. Go to backcountryhunters.org to learn more about that and hope to see you there.